So, we're about to kick off and um, just wanted to say welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming down today. Um, my name is Stefan. I'm the CEO of Creative HQ. For those of you who don't know me, hello. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we've got a absolutely stunner of a lineup tonight and I'm super stoked uh, for all of you to help us warm up our new uh, space. The um, startup uh, startup base here in Wellington, um, our new offices. Uh, as you can tell, brand new. Uh, some of the paint is probably still wet, so uh, don't touch the walls. Um, but yeah, um, I think we can make it work tonight, um, and we're super stoked to have this event uh, help us uh, warm it up. So um, let's get on with the event, and let's have our panel members up on stage, please. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so just want to say this is a, a startup tech meetup tonight, um, which we're organizing as part of our um, Startup Garage series, which we've run over the year. And this is a, sort of like a nice highlight at the end of the year. Um, and if you're interested in this, these kinds of events, definitely um, get yourself signed up to the meetup for um, the Startup Garage, um, which Laura runs and is absolutely fantastic. I also wanted to just quickly say thank you so much to um, Grow Wellington, who's basically organized uh, food and drinks tonight. So thank you very much, Grow Wellington, uh, for the sponsorship. Yay. <laughs> and, and for um, Kiwi Connect, who are doing the uh, um, video uh, filming tonight and uh, have kindly offered to uh, share the video with us, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and so, yeah, we've got... Um, fantastic lineup tonight. Uh, I'm sure um, many of you will, will know uh, the, the faces here. Um, I won't uh, talk too much about uh, each of them because they can do a much better job themselves. But basically, um, we've got uh, Brian and Matthew um, Monaghan, uh, who have got... You know, just say, Hello, just in case people are <laughs> Uh, who have uh, got an ID management um, company and are also co-creators of Kiwi Connect. So um, welcome to the Credit uh, HQ startup base. And we've got um, Scott Nolan from um, uh, Founders um, Fund uh, over from the, uh, the States. So um, thank you very much for coming over, um, Scott. And we've got um, Sam Altman from Y Combinator. Uh, thank you very much for coming over. Uh, from my combinator, um, and I'll let you guys talk a little bit more about your background. And of course, you'll all know this guy here, Rod from uh, Zero, CEO of Zero. Uh, thank you so much for coming down and uh, being part of the panel. So, without much further ado, because I'm sure you'd much rather hear these guys talk to me, um, I'd like to hand you over to your MC for the night, uh, Laura Rytel from Crave HQ. I will take you through the rest of the night. Bye, Laura. Hi. Hope you all can hear us um, half decently. Um, I will now hand just over the mic to all of you, so you can do your two sentences on uh, introducing yourself and why you think you're so amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm Sam Altman. I'm the president of Y Combinator. Uh, we're based in the States, and we fund startups. Uh, we funded uh, more than 800 now. So quite a lot. Uh, some of them have been uh, Reddit and Dropbox and Airbnb and Stripe and a lot of others. And we also try to build up the most sort of helpful network for founders that we can. Uh, we hope that by doing that, we can make it much easier to start companies and then help develop technology into really big companies that um, you know we all use and love every day. That's my two sentences. Cool. Great heavy and town, Sam. Um, uh, so what you don't know about Zero? So what's interesting about us? We're at US 100 million annualized of revenue and a 80 plus percent growth rate. So we're the of all the public SaaS companies, the fastest growing one at our size. So you know it's pretty cool. And why it's cool is we've done it largely out of the US and we've done it in the small business space, which isn't just a bunch of deals. It's actually building scalable sales systems. So you know we think we're doing some world class stuff. Hi, I'm Scott from Founders Fund. Um, we're a venture capital firm in San Francisco and we invest across pretty much every sector, every stage. Um, so some of our companies include Facebook, 
SpaceX, uh, Spotify, Palantir, uh, Airbnb, a whole bunch of others. So we try and back things that we think are going to be the really important technologies and change the industries uh, that are really going to matter in the coming years. And um, yeah, I'd say that's that's kind of what we do. So it's going to be fun to talk about. Uh, I'm Matthew Monahan, brother Brian, and uh, we started a company called Inflection eight years ago, which was really seeking to organize public records online, uh, which brought us deep into the genealogy space and family history space. And in 2012, we sold that uh, business to Ancestry.com and had a really nice exit. And uh, since then, we've been really focused on the identity management space with a, a suite of tools, especially as it relates to the sharing economy. Um, Kiwi Connect is really a venture designed to build bridges between Silicon Valley and the New Zealand startup ecosystem. So we're just very privileged and excited to be here uh, with you all tonight. And uh, our journey to New Zealand started in 2010. We just really fell in love with the country uh, when we came out and visited. And frankly, we were a bit surprised. Um, and speaking of surprises, Bimo. Yo, yo, I hope y'all ready to go because I'm ready to flow. And blow like a volcano, y'all ain't even ready to know. There's so much excitement and so many good feelings as we're here today to celebrate and creative HQ of New Zealand. When you come from overseas, the first thing you see is just trees and honeybees, <laughs> clean mountain springs and endless fields of green. From the jungle valley to the mountain peaks, we listen to Mother Nature and hear loudly she speaks. Got world champion rugby and Lord of the Rings, awesome Manuka honey and Earth's happiest sheep. <laughs> it's literally in tomorrow. 21 hours ahead means three hours behind. Southern hemisphere, different stars, a whole different sense of time. But then you look closer and more is perceived. Cause like a tree, New Zealand's roots run strong and deep. With a culture not based on commerce, but on kindness. One that values the importance of wisdom, balance and silence. Kiwis value fairness, compassion, and honesty. Witty and reflective with self-effacing modesty. Balancing individual responsibility with deep civic connections. Leaders elected fairly in honest, open elections. <laughs> now I'm not saying that it ain't got problems. <laughs> like any place it's got its due. What I'm saying is let's solve those problems in New Zealand first as we solve them for the rest of the world too. And let me speak it quite clearly so that you all can hear me. You ain't gotta live in New Zealand to live Kiwi. It's a state of mind shift. It's a different way of being. It's a different way of taking action and a different way of dreaming. Of an information economy based in a regenerative ecology, spreading philosophy through technology about how it is that we've gotta be living on this planet Fairness standard, none abandoned. Grounded skillfully into being, seeing this life that we've been handed. So if you resonate with that, then after the rap, we'll connect and we'll talk to each other. Because the world ain't flat. So the edge of one map always begins another. Peace. <laughs> we do learn. A little more than two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> I think that just made it the most passionate Kiwi I have ever met. Um, cool. So the format for the evening, by the way, I'm going to ask these guys a bunch of questions, and then you can ask them a bunch of questions. So I'm going to put my mic after this uh, over to the stand in the corner there, um, and you can line up if you have a question, so be prepared in about half an hour. Um, hope you're not too bored until then. Cool. Uh, let's kick it out. So by the way, by the show of hands, how many in the house are entrepreneurs? Hands up. Nice. We're start talking about startups, so you're in the right place. Um, so maybe just the first question. Um, how do you know that you're supposed to do a startup, that you want to start a company? Like, how do you know it's the right thing and when to start? 
um, maybe Sam, Scott, whoever wants to. Sure. Yeah, I would say only do a company if you feel like it's the only thing you can do. If it's the thing you must do, if without you doing this, this company won't exist and it has to exist. Um, if you don't feel that strongly about it, then the hard times of starting a company are just so hard that you're probably better off joining another company that you're really passionate about and help them achieve their mission. So I think that's that's my basic guideline for that. Uh, our version of this is that you should uh, you should only start a company if you're in love with that particular idea. Um, you shouldn't start a startup for the sake of having a startup. You should have an idea. You really believe this something that you want to do and the people you want to do it with. Um, you know, starting a startup is sort of extremely hard, like unimaginably hard, but just barely doable. But it's so hard that if you don't believe in this and if you don't want to do it for 10 years, um, you know, there are sort of better things to do. And it's better to join a great company than to start a mediocre one. Um, but all of that said, it's, you know, it's doable. And, um, you know, I think we found that we can actually help, that, that startups are much more doable, I think, than people think. Um, it looks like now we have enough data to say this confidently. More than 1% of the startups that we fund go on to be worth more than a billion dollars. And they go on to change industries that they're in. And they, you know, they, they change. Like, And this is not just in software, but everywhere. Um, and I think you know, New Zealand is sort of one of the top up and coming areas that we see for startups that we're funding. And that, you know, startups are staying here. They're coming to the US. They're not wherever. But you know, there's clearly the environment here to support it. So if it's something you really want to do, you should do it. But if it's not something you really want to do, then it, it is way more pain than it's than it's worth. So short answer, you need to be obsessed. Yeah? Okay. Um, so it, talking about startup teams, um, the amount of people that you have to be around you, so, you know, um, coming out of accelerators, YC, Techstars, our own lighting lab, we tend to take in only teams and not individuals um, because startups are hard. Um, so what are you looking for in a team as a very young company, like starting off the ground? Um, what are the important traits to have? Well, here's just one data point from what we have. Um, no company that we've ever funded that has been founded by one person is in our top 30 most successful companies, even though we fund a fair number of single founder companies. It is possible for sure, and there's many great examples around the world, but the, these things, again, are so hard to do, and the psychology ups and downs are so intense that if you have a co-founder or two, hopefully, like, you're not all at the sort of crash at the same time, and you kind of support each other. Um, one thing that we say is that startups usually, the expected value dips below the x-axis at some point, and things go really wrong. And if you're by yourself, you're just going to stop. And if you have a co-founder, you will sort of like, out of obligation to each other, keep going. And you can sort of like cheat this like law of ther thermodynamics somehow and both do it to support the other person. Um, on the other side, we've never had a startup with four or more founders be really successful. Um, it's one of these things where there's like exponential commun uh, or I guess factorial communication overhead. And it just gets way, way harder. So in our experience, two or three co-founders works the best, but I'm sure others. <laughs> Yeah, I had that training off of what he said. You know, the, the ups and downs of, of emotional volatility and the need to have partners there to really balance you out. So balance in terms of the mood and the tempo and the energy, but also balance in terms of skill sets and aptitudes, trying to find people who, who complement your unique gifts to create a, a social unit. Uh, I you know, was fortunate to work on inflection with my brother Matthew and so there was a, a really, really deep pre-existing relationship which transcended the financial matters of the business and I think that was really powerful. So you know, in terms of thinking about teams and, and coworkers is having really strong values alignment, that sort of deep connection and ideally that values alignment around your product. Uh, to see you through the tough times and to to draw people in towards the, the collective mission. Awesome. Um, Rod, maybe you can uh, share some thoughts on how to recruit. So once you are in the stage where your company takes off and scaling, so how do you actually build a great team around a good product? Yeah, so I'm kind of um, sad with myself that there's so many new people I haven't met yet. I thought we'd hired everybody. But I'm excited that I haven't hired everybody and there's a whole room full of people. So 
So I think what's sort of different in, um, in Wellington and New Zealand from 10 years ago is the choices sort of two years ago were kind of work, work for a boring traditional company or go and do a startup. And you know what's happened in the New Zealand tech scene in the last um, you know, five years especially is we've now seen some companies of scale. So um, startups are great and you know, um, the natural, you know, there's lots of people that have peeled out of us to do their own thing. Um, and uh, it's interesting though, we've had actually quite a few people come back because startups are also really hard, all of those things. But actually what we're seeing now is these new types of larger companies that give people fantastic experience doing things that we haven't been able to do before. And out of that, uh, those people will no doubt go and start their own businesses in time. But now we have the sort of in the middle career option, which is being internal entrepreneurs inside uh, fast moving companies. We can grab as much responsibility as you like, but you have resources to go, experience scale and experience the, the new skills that are gonna be um, are really relevant when you choose to do your own thing. I think also what we're seeing is, um, especially in the cloud, um, you know, the, the model we used to see was, um, you know, with most of the tech happening in the US, there was a natural concentration of technology, uh, you know, in the US market. So you'd build things in small countries and the model would be to flog it off to a US public company. But with the internet now, where distribution's global, we're actually seeing businesses of scale happening from outside of the US. And what's cool is, um, you know, I think uh, countries like New Zealand and, and other countries are actually uh, great places to live, and you can have this hybrid of, of doing big things outside of the US, but still connecting to these awesome networks where people just think bigger and have more experience and really understand scale. You know? I don't know if I answered your question, but it was fun saying all that. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think having something like a zero get built in a city is this unbelievable thing. It's, it's very, very hard to do the first time but having such a successful technology company creates this entire ecosystem of people that work there and then go on and do new things and invest in startups. And I, you know, I think that's just that's such an incredible asset for the city to have and, and the startup scene that, that is almost guaranteed to develop out of that success is awesome. Yeah, and I think the original question was about what's the best way to network or recruit and and in our experience the best way to recruit is through your network through people that you know really well uh, first degree secondary connections people you've worked with before those are the long relationships where you just can know ahead of time are, are is it going to be great to work with them or not um, as opposed to just trying to kind of go through uh, the standard channels and so in Silicon Valley almost all recruiting is done through friends friends of friends that's that's just how it gets done, and in our experience, it works the best. So um, that's what that's what we'd recommend. Maybe follow on to that. Um, building company culture. A lot of people talk about that, and I know that Brian and Matthew, you guys have done some interesting things. Um, you know, traditionally startups do crazy long hours and stay up all night, and you've sort of taken a different view on that. Um, so why don't you just maybe give us a little bit of understanding why and how it's working and, and um, how does that culture help you um, execute? Well, I think it relates to recruiting. I mean, recruiting is one of the hardest things the whole time, all the time. Um, inflection, we're now at 250 people and it's still the hardest thing is, is recruiting and finding, finding great talent that, that fits the culture and, and fits our needs. Um, you know, as it relates to culture, you know, there are a lot of ideas and it's kind of, you know, we're, we're living in a time and an era where there's just an abundance of opportunities. And so I think what really makes the difference and what sets apart great companies is the ability to execute on those ideas. And so if you kind of work backwards from there and you say, well, how, how do you create an environment where execution is, uh, is excellent? Uh, or as excellent as possible, a lot of that has to do with a team of people who like coming to work every day, who enjoy each other's company. Uh, the long hours are part of the deal. You know, the really hard work is part of the deal. It's like a given to accomplish the goals. And it comes more naturally if everyone's aligned um, in the moment of what the company is trying to do and the mission of the organization. It doesn't come naturally to just kind of say, you know, we expect 12 hours a day um, and, and I think in America especially we kind of wear it as a badge of honor if we work really really long hours but it's not always the most productive hours 
Um, so I think that's one thing that Kiwi culture is really well suited for in terms of there is a, a good holistic sense of, of lifestyle balance. Um, you know, as, as the panelists suggested, I mean, it, it's incredibly hard to do this. So it's going to be really, really hard work. But some of the things we've done at Inflection, we have um, a fun role that we call happiness engineer. And it's someone that's dedicated to really just um, creating different uh, events and opportunities to lift the culture up. We do a lot of celebrations uh, for each other, you know, milestones that happen in people's lives outside of work, just recognizing that we're going to spend more time with our coworkers than our family members typically. And so when there's things happening, whether it's birthdays or uh, pregnancies or you know, different sorts of uh, weddings and, and these types of things, they should be absolutely celebrated in more of a community spirit and that really brings people together and, uh, and leads to those types of referrals where people will tell their friends, hey, you should come work here. And, and that ends up being, like Scott said, the, the key to recruiting as well. Yeah, to, to tail off just one aspect of, of what he said around the importance of having that alignment around the company's mission and I'm, I'm reflecting, sort of thinking about the shoes that you'll often be in in a relatively small market where you might have to be working with a lot of international teams. Uh, we deal with this at Inflection. We have offices in uh, San, San Francisco, but also in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and Tel Aviv, Israel. And one of the interesting things is how do you create a cohesive corporate culture and good uh, intercompany relations when you're dealing with team members who maybe speak a different language and are coming from a very different uh, corporate in, or, or very different culture altogether. And I imagine that a lot of entrepreneurs here in New Zealand will be working with international uh, teams as well. And I think the thing that's been most significant for us in this has been that establishment around the company's core mission and then the building of these personal relationships with are the leadership of our offshore teams uh, that transcends just the business dynamic. It's understanding about their kids and understanding about their family and their upbringing and all these different things. And that person to person relationship, from my perspective, is the bedrock of, a, of an effective corporate culture. So I think that there are, um, in addition to the interpersonal pieces, there, there are two other things that we really think about um, that, that make a culture great. Uh, one is momentum. So you know, winning teams tend to keep winning, and teams that sort of take their eye off the ball and start losing tend to keep losing. And so one of the most important jobs as the entrepreneur is to make sure the company never stops winning, because it, you know, it's very difficult to dig yourself out of that hole. And if you keep that going, it's this sort of this this ongoing, you know, it's just this ongoing tailwind. Um, the other thing that we see is sort of the um, the missionary mercenary divide. Uh, I think most cultures end up being either a uh, mercenary culture or a missionary culture, and the great companies are always the missionary cultures. If people believe in the mission, if you are sufficiently ambitious, if you present people, you know, we're going to make this big impact and we're going to reach these people and we're going to do this important thing that's going to you know, be great for the world, that's what motivates the best people. And if you have a culture like that, where, where you do have this ambitious, important thing, uh, it's easier to motivate people. In many ways, it is easier to start a hard company than it is to start an easy company. More people will be excited. You'll have a better culture if you're doing something that matters, if you're doing this, this big thing. Um, if you have the kind of culture where you're telling people, like, you need to get into your desk at 9 and leave at 9 because we work 12-hour days, like, people might do that for a little while. Um, but that is, that is almost never. In fact, that is, just, that is not what I have ever seen produce great results. Yeah, and then in addition to all this, I'd say the one thing that you can do to make culture great at a company, and it sounds like not all uh, New Zealand comp companies do this, is give, give equity, give options to every single employee at the company. This is the one thing where if you take two identical companies, at one of them everybody has equity, at the other only the founders do, the one where everybody has equity will win every single time because everybody is so aligned around just making this thing succeed, and all of a sudden politics you know, go down dr dramatically because the one thing that matters is let's make this thing win. Um, so that's the one, one piece of advice I'd give is just give equity to every employee. This is what Google did early on. This is what all the Silicon Valley companies do at this point. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, let's talk about products. Um, figuring out how to build a great product. Um, you guys obviously have picked some good winners 
and seen that very up close. Um, so maybe a little bit, a few tips, what to keep in mind when trying to build a really, really good product. Um, so, so you get lots of business plans coming through and um, you know, I think the, the thing is to go and test those products with, with people and, and uh, very early on get your idea out there and, and test it because most ideas are stupid and, um, and they'll be flawed in some fatal way and, so, you know, and, and founders don't want to hear that but actually hearing that and sort of making things come through. But I think you know, the sort of characteristics we see from New Zealand that are common, very design centric, very um, sort of end user focused and very iterative because you know, we don't have a huge amount of capital, so it's getting something we want pretty quickly, and then, and then the customers will drive it in a, in, in, um, a big direction. Um, there's, there are some places, though, where you would look. So if, you know, if I was thinking about doing things now, I think um, you know, if you want to do something quickly, it doesn't require a huge amount of capital. The enterprise SaaS space is huge, and so many broken problems, like you know, directories still don't work. You know, YAM is fucked. And uh, you know, it's one of those with a like I'm a Google sign on. You know, there's still so many big problems that you just you know we've got a thousand people now, and everything's broken. So you know, those are things that don't require a huge sales force. We've seen the Atlassians and the Yammer sales model. There's some really great easy products that that are just crying out to be built. We've got ten of them. Come and see me afterwards. The best companies do a few things across the board. Everyone's you know, successful in a different way, but the commonalities, um, one is they talk to users very early, uh, you know, that they, they don't try to keep their idea secret, they're open, they actually listen. You know, like a common founder mistake is to talk to users because someone told them they're supposed, they're supposed to, but be so convinced they know the right answer to not actually listen to what their users are saying. And you know, you have to build something that's so good that users spontaneously talk about how much they love it. Like that is the test and that is eventually how you keep growing. Um, the, the second thing that correlates really well is like obsessive customer service. So, you know, where like the founders themselves are constantly talking, but it, this is part of talking to users. Um, and then the, the, the third thing is a very short cycle time. So the way to make a great product is to make it better every day. And if you make it say 2% better every day, that compounds exponentially over time. And, and, and the best companies get this very tight feedback loop. Uh, they have an idea, they test it, they change it, they test it, they change it, and they keep going in. This, over time, produces incredible results. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on this point is an obsession with the details of the product quality to a level where they almost, where it's almost like stupid, or does tend to correlate with success. So founders that like, you know, spend a lot of time on their documentation pages and their jobs pages and that if, you know, like there's this uh, famous YC lore story where um, Drew was supposed to be speaking, Drew has in the final job office, would be speaking at a YC event. Um, a new version of like Windows in Sweden, Service Pack 2, something like that, you know, went out that broke Dropbox for like seven users and he just canceled the speaking event to go fix it because it was like bothering him that much that it was like broken for this tiny number of users. So there's this like obsession with like quality of the product, which is what makes users love it. Um, that turns out to be really important. Yeah, I'd say in addition to creating a great product, you don't want to make something that someone else can just go copy tomorrow. So you do all this hard work of, wow, we finally found product market fit. Uh, people love our product, they're talking about it. But somebody just literally copied us and raised a bunch of money to go distribute this. So what you also want to build into the product, in addition to product market fit, is some way in which as you grow, no one can catch up or you get further and further ahead of the competition. So, you know, people talk about network effects or like data scale. Building thing, these things in from the very beginning is a key way to make sure that once you go to all the hard work of building that great product, you actually get something out of it at the end of the day and you're, you're going to be a standalone company for a very long time. So as um, investors, we, we talked a little bit about um, having a vision for the company. And as investors, you, you look at obviously for companies that are valued high down the line, somewhere in the future. Um, so how important is having a vision and mission when an entrepreneur comes and pitches to you for getting into YC or getting funding from Founders Fund? Um, so yeah, the importance of having a vision. Uh, you know, here is one really important point. 
which is that people get more ambitious over time. And when you know the founders of Airbnb first came to us, uh, they were delighted they had three users. And if we told them that someday they were going to be running a you know fifty billion dollar company, whatever it's going to be, you know, with more nights than any hotel chain in the world, they would have la- looked at us and said, uh, "You're crazy! Like we don't want to work with you because you don't know what you're talking about." Um, so, I think there's this like pressure in the last couple of years to have an immediate vision about how you're going to have this you know ten hundred billion dollar company, and no one honestly has that in their in their first days. Google almost sold the company for a million dollars. Um, they would have if like the offer came through. Um, you know, like the so uh, like Zuckerberg very very nearly sold sold uh, Facebook to Yahoo for a billion dollars. So um, it's okay to like uh, become more ambitious as you go. In fact, that's what should happen. So. What we look for is people that have a kernel of an idea that we believe can develop into something huge, but you can't focus on that right away. You have to focus on delivering something great for a small number of users first. The way we talk about this is that you know there's like you can either create an initial product that a lot of users really like, or that a small number of users really love. Obviously, you'd like to make something that a lot of users really love, but those ideas get taken by big companies and you can't compete with them, and so. You don't have to have a takeover the world plan on day one. In fact, very few of the companies that we've been involved with that have gone on to do it um, thought they were going to initially. They just, the founder had something they were really passionate about. They had a plan, as Scott was saying, about how they had some defensibility, and it just grows and grows and grows from there. But at the same time, you can be, you can be extremely ambitious from day one, so, but maybe over time, right? So here's an example, SpaceX. Elon had already done a couple of companies, so maybe he had the right to be really, really huge vision. But from day one, it was, we're going to Mars, and that's where this company, like, that's the success case. And right. Sort but, of, Mars is not success. But, but product one, so yeah, you can have a vision like that, but product one was not, like, let's build the Mars colonial transport. No, you don't start with that. You can't, that's, that's <laughs> the thing, right? That's um, a bad idea. So, like, uh, in fact, we just funded a rocket company, um, the next YC batch, and they would like to go to Mars too someday. But their initial project was to launch 20 kilo satellites. Um, and that's sort of what I meant by you can, you can start with something less ambitious. As a startup, so you have your first product, you hopefully have your first small number of users who love that product. When do you actually know that you're ready you're, you're for your first financing round? But what needs to happen? I'll go public and say what. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, for me, I think sort of entrepreneurship is a series of baby steps. So, what you normally hear about is the deal that got smacked out of the park, you know, right at the start. But actually, a much more repeatable process is, you know, starting small and um, and going through the process, actually being in the game. So, you know, with each deal, you're going to get, you know, better networks, more experience. Your ideas will be bigger. You have more of your own capital. So you have the right to own more of more of the next one. So my thing zero is the fourth or fifth one I've done. And um, uh, what what you know, so I think when you when you're starting out, if you think of it as a series of steps, like getting getting funded is more important than the the amount you get funded or the um, the amount that you dilute in the first deal. You want to get in and get that experience and hopefully turn it around quickly, get to a good exit, or at least be graceful on the way through, so that when the time you get the next one, which will be even bigger, um, and then um, and then you go. What's interesting though now is um, a, a, there are still lots of small things you can do, but the the industry's moved along quite a bit, and with this um, technology shift we're seeing, with, you know, especially cloud software, where the economics of getting out to mass markets are. Um, have just fundamentally changed and you've got a bunch of incumbents in there which which find it really hard to move there are businesses that will be successful just by raising the most money and and having the the right then to hire the team to go so our strategy was zero uh, like after mail when we sold that we had 23 staff and everyone's doing five jobs so when we did zero we needed 50 people from day one so that was half a million a month you needed three years it was 15 million bucks so we had to do an ipo because at that time we couldn't raise that sort of money here. So, so that forced us to do that. But we won when we did that, because now we've had seven or eight years, we've raised, I think, 250 US, we've deployed at least a couple hundred million of capital. So part of our business model is having this massive moat. 
So no one else is being funded in our space to any scale. And if they did, we'd see them coming for three to four years. So, so, um, so I think a few years ago, you could, there were still lots of cool things you could do on a, on a shoestring. But now, uh, to do these really big things, and I think everyone's aspirations, everyone wants to now build a multi-billion dollar company, it actually requires massive amounts of capital, and that's part of the strategy. But you might have to do a couple of lean things to get going before you can really gas up the tank. Does that make sense? I was just going to say, you know, I think it depends on the company and the strategy and the sector and a lot of different parameters. I mean, we were able to bootstrap our company for the first three and a half to, to four years and, and therefore retain a, a good chunk of equity and control. And I think for a lot of uh, software companies, that might apply. But there are a lot of businesses that, you know, as Rod says, are just really capital intensive. Um, if you're going into energy or agriculture or manufacturing, uh, the likelihood that you can finance that sort of bootstraps or from your savings or friends and family rounds is just a, a lot less. And it's really important to think about, you know, raising capital is not the finish line. It's an enabler. And, you know, there's a lot of press and attention that goes to these capital rounds, but that's not success in and of itself. That just means you have a, a chance to play. And it's a really big commitment who you bring on as your finance partner especially at the early stages, because you're going to be deeply, deeply connected to that individual or that firm for the duration of their shareholding. And it's just crucial that you're working with someone who can help you to be successful. Uh, it's where groups like Y Combinator are so exciting. Is it's so much more than just the seed capital uh, or foundation for that matter. That, uh, these, these firms are crucial in creating the success of the companies that they invest in. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as you're thinking about capital raising. Um, Rob, maybe back to you. When is the right time to um, for a Kiwi company to open an office abroad? Um, yeah. So what we did, we um, uh, we when when other businesses are done, we've been to Australia quite quickly, and Australians hate buying things off New Zealanders. So um, with, with Zero, what we did was we went to the UK first. And the reason we went to the UK is, even though it's expensive, um, you know, it's a small, dense country, so it's a mass market. And you can kind of use the New Zealand mafia to you know, get started quite quickly. And um, so, the, so the UK is an, an ideal first market. It's hard work because the, the days uh, don't connect that well. Um, so you're always working late or uh, starting really early to work with the UK team. But that's a good first market. And then, then um, and also for, for in our industry, the UK tax is very close to uh, to what happens here. And then we came back to Australia, being a global company, not a New Zealand company, going to Australia. So that really helped for us. Um, we could, we, you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have even delayed the US for uh, for, for another year. But we had a lot of pressure to uh, to get there because that's the that's the big market. But um, you know, when when we first started, we were thinking that oh man, we were so unlucky. We had this little market of four million people. If you were, you know, if, if you're sort of based in Boston and you want to go to four million people, you can drive for an hour. If you want to go to five million, you can drive for an hour and ten minutes. Whereas for us to get five million customers, you have to be an exporter and do all that sort of stuff. But um, actually, what turned out is, is starting in a small market was really good for us. So we could get the product, you know, up to about you know version twelve uh, by the time we really presented overseas. So when we presented, we were a pretty fit company with some really good product. Um, and uh, uh, so, I mean, it's different for each company, but I think um, a lot of New Zealand companies, especially following us, are going too fast, too too far, too quickly. We've got massive markets really close to us, and you know, and when you're scaling these businesses, having four fronts is huge. So I'd be focused on getting uh, a few countries really locked in. You know, you want to do New Zealand, get your first export market, go hard on that. That's so much bigger than here, and then and then um, and then go. But it's so hard because everyone's telling you you got to go, go quick. One of the big things we learned is, um, you know, you don't bank on this, but you'll always be surprised at the slowness of the speed of your competitors, and that's what we found. Do you do have time? Just another question. So, you, Scott, and Sam, you've both invested into some Kiwi companies as well. Um, so, what what would you say are the main differences between the teams or entrepreneurs or companies coming from New Zealand versus the ones that you invested in in the US? Like, are there, is there, are there any things that we should conscious, be conscious of, do better, um, 
Just any tips, any thoughts on that? I mean, generally, I don't think, I think it's like difficult to classify companies by a particular country. Um, the one thing I tell founders anywhere outside of the US as a general statement is that uh, it's, it's okay in the US to be sort of, um, arrogant is the wrong word, but it's okay to be ambitious, I would say. I think it's, it is more forgivable to stand up as a complete unknown and say, you know, I'm gonna try and start the best search engine in the world. I'm gonna try and start a rocket company that's gonna take me to Mars so I can die there. Or I'm going to start a, you know, social network. And I know you think I'm crazy because it's just starting with college students, but someday everyone in the world is gonna use it. And, and people aren't afraid to fail. If you fail at something big, like, I think Silicon Valley is even a little bit too forgiving of that. Um, but it is one thing that has worked really well for US-based companies. Um, so we didn't take that too far, because I think in the US we take all that stuff a little bit too far, but I would just sort of, that's my general advice anytime I'm out of the, out of the States. Yeah, and I think part of that though is you don't want to be saying stuff that's actually crazy and wrong, right? right? So I think another thing that goes, goes into this, and you were asking early on, what do we look for in great founding teams? And I think one thing is both you have that crazy idea but you've also actually thought it through so completely that you don't even mind if people criticize it and ask you all tons of questions about it. You have all the answers. And so no matter what question they ask, you've already thought about it, you've already researched it. Um, so you need to have you know, real conviction in, in what you're saying you're gonna do and not just boasting about it or just making ridiculous claims. So I think that's the other, the other part is just this really well-constructed, realistic model of the world and how your company fits into that. Um, in a real way. Cool. Um, I'm going to ask my last question now. So if you guys have any questions, then feel free to sort of move around, line yourselves up. I'm going to put the mic right there so you can go come and ask your questions. Um, please do have some questions. Um, so just Christmas around the corner, wishful thinking. Um, so in the next couple of years, what would you love to see out of New Zealand coming from here, Wellington, Auckland, anywhere in New Zealand? What do you think our competitive advantage is in front of you know, the rest of the world? Um, anything? Yeah, so there's probably a bunch of sectors that New Zealand knows better than anybody else. Uh, ag is one, so I'd expect there's probably a bunch of great ag tech that, that can come out um, and be used across the world. Another unique aspect is New Zealand is smaller and I think there's less regulatory overhead than there is in other countries. So, you know, in the US, for example, we've been waiting for years for the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, to say what, what are the rules around drones. Um, and so US companies are going elsewhere to work on that stuff. I think New Zealand could be one of those great places for that. So I think hopefully we see things in the specific sectors that New Zealand knows better than anybody else and then things that exploit unique aspects about New Zealand also. Um, yeah, so, so two, two answers. So, so the stuff we're working on at the moment, which is really cool, which we have a competitive advantage on, is uh, what we're doing in banking. So we have a, a real good banking blueprint now that we call Banking 2.0. We were rolling out and getting the four banks, because there's only four small banks here, so we can um, get stuff done. So that's working really well, and uh, we, that's already rolling out. We've got uh, banks in Australia rolling out the model in the UK, and uh, we have Silicon Valley Bank, City First National, and the first other one. So they're, they're learning from what we're doing here. The other thing that's really interesting is what's happening on the, um, how the business, how the government side. And already the lessons we've been learning around getting web services into government, we're able to play those out. We just acquired a uh, employee uh, state payroll tax uh, company. And that allows us to um, actually have a really good uh, conversation with US federal government and take some of the case studies we have here and, and sort of export those. So New Zealand's a great lab for that. The thing we're not doing, which you guys should be asking about, is we don't have a technology plan for New Zealand. And um, our competitive advantage is, as the guys are saying, that you can actually get stuff done here and we're small enough that everybody's um, his blood relatives or at least exchange fluids at some point. So, um, so we can actually get stuff done. And, and, but, and it's a really good test lab for, for uh, the rest of the world. So we should be um, aggressively getting things like Apple Pay working down here. 
you know, we're, we're talking really hard to Elon at the moment to get some Teslas because, you know, we have the highest renewable energy in a long, skinny country. So we should, you know, they should win the government contract fleet. There's a whole lot of cool test lab things that we can do here. And with the connections we have to Silicon Valley now, we should need to be actively pushing that. But that requires a New Zealand technology strategy. Yeah, I, I think philosophically, one thing I've heard mentioned in the New Zealand ecosystem is this notion of, you know, moving away from primary industries into technology. And I think one of the themes that we're all echoing here is just you know, thinking more about it as, as where, where technology intersects with the strengths of New Zealand already. Um, you know, the, the things that Brian and I have been really attracted to this country for, uh, along with our, our other uh, co-workers and so forth, is uh, one of the themes is around the environment. I think that the planet needs us to have a more responsible relationship to the environment uh, globally. And New Zealand is far from perfect in this, in this area, but it has such a better canvas for innovation and opportunity than I think a lot of places do. Uh, so whether that's in ag tech or whether it's around water management or whether it's around uh, renewables and so forth, I think there's, there's just a tremendous amount of work to be done. And if we can solve it here, we can export that IP. It can create you know, incredible economic opportunity for New Zealanders and jobs and so forth, but also be uh, really important for the world. Uh, and then the other area I'll just mention briefly is uh, digital media and education. You know, there's so much talent here in Wellington around, around film and media, and I think what we're seeing in terms of the connectivity of going from two to three billion people online to, to the entire world being connected within the next decade, um, these platforms are disrupting how we access information, how we receive media and content. And so the, the great content creators of our, of our times in the next, in the next couple decades will get a chance to influence the education systems, we'll get a chance to tell stories, we'll get a chance to really inspire people globally, and, uh, and that doesn't need to just be Hollywood. Um, and obviously Hollywood has, has pervaded consciousness and culture for, for many years, and I think, I think Wellington is really terrifically positioned in this respect, and that's something we're really, we're really excited about as well. One thing I believe very deeply is you should never start a company in a particular area because someone on a panel tells you that like you're well suited for that. That is just a recipe for disaster. Um, so I will try to not name specific areas because I think anyone in the world can now compete in any area they want. Like one of the one of the really amazing things about the level of globalization that we've had and, and, and the depth that the internet has reached is that like anything you can do in the US, you ought to be able to do in New Zealand. That said, um, I really want to echo the point about the advantage of being a small country. Um, I think that it's so much easier to do something disruptive in a lot of different spaces here. Uh, you know, like a really ambitious startup in New Zealand could probably get a government regulation change, um, which in the US is just like laughably impossible. Um, you know, having a small but concentrated customer base that you can test with you can iterate on it, you can get to this point where you build a product that people love before you unleash it on the world um, is incredibly valuable. So I do think that no matter what you decide to do, you should use the advantages of being in a smaller contained ecosystem, which are huge as much as you can. Audience questions? That's good. Um, if you have a question, please do not be afraid the mic won't bite. I'm, I'm from a startup that is building a dev tool and we're finding, as you say, the New Zealand market is really great for testing and getting to know people, but our market really is in the States. Uh, dealing with companies over emails is fantastic, but dealing with investors seems to, to be impossible. Um, they don't seem to want to invest outside of their own suburb, let alone their country. Um, is that something you're seeing changing or um, kind of progressing, or is that something that really does require you to move to the US? It is changing for sure, um, and it is easier to raise money now online or without in-person meetings than ever before, but I think the correct way to think of fundraising is like really high value sales, and just like any other sort of sales, um, the human connection really matters and doing it in person is so much better. So one thing that happens at Y Combinator a lot is that companies will come to the Valley for a period of time 
raise money because it's like a hundred times, literally a hundred times easier to do it in person and then go back to whatever country they're from. And it used to be that most investors wouldn't do that. They would say like, I only want to invest in companies that are going to stay, you know, within 20 miles of Palo Alto. But that has totally changed. Um, that is like long over now. And, but I still think it's, it, it is for sure a lot harder to raise money via email. Um, in fact, so hard that other than something like AngelList, I don't recommend trying it. And I think it's just worth it. If you can't raise money from investors here, which hopefully you can, then I would just you know, be willing to fly a lot. Do you have children? Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> well, don't be a pussy and get on the plane. <laughs> uh, just one point I would add is like if you look at a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs and companies out there they got told no a lot of times and so just remember to be persistent and determined and you know continuing to check in of whether you're just being insane or not but um, I think you know that that persistence is, is really incredibly important My question is about um, open source and startups. So companies like um, WordPress or Firefox, but they open source or Silverstripe and Wellington, that open source most of their IP. Do you guys have thoughts about that? Where companies can succeed doing that, or is it harder? Well, one one company that uh, famously open sourced all its IP was Tesla recently. I think last year, or maybe earlier this year. And the reason they did that, in my opinion, is because it creates a standard, and it brings everyone onto their platform. So I think there's a lot of times when it strategically makes a ton of sense. So let's say you open source a portion of what you're doing because it's gonna either create a standard standard or bring a lot of developers onto onto your platform. There's you have to think through the strategy of why it makes sense for your specific business. Um, but but it's been done successfully a bunch of times. I'm not sure if that answers the yeah, question no. though. Just again I'd say, um, who cares? Like, you know, so open source is a really interesting uh, philosophy and, you know, we use stuff and we try to contribute stuff, but it's not, like, that wouldn't be my primary thing for building a business, unless there was some, you know, really cool business about being open source, but I think we've kind of moved on from that. And especially with these SaaS platforms, you've got so much sitting in the cloud on your servers, it's so hard to rip uh, people off, and I think it's all those benefits of sharing, creating standards, and all those things, but I think open source was really interesting when as a movement five to ten years ago, but we don't really think about it anymore. It's just part of part of the plumbing. More questions? Yeah, I'm just maybe because I have a different perspective on it. You know, with, with the open source, I think you know what Scott said really resonates to me. Like thinking through the strategy um, is crucially important. I, I would say, you know, in seeing how the the projects and products that we've been involved in they would have never happened if it weren't for so many amazing software developers and companies and open source tools that existed. And so I think when your strategy allows it to get to the point of seeing that as a place where you can really uh, support the mission that you're on to create those types of standards to further the industries, you know, I think the social enterprise community in Wellington has done a phenomenal job embracing open source. and. You know, personally, I think it's a, I think it's a really terrific philosophy that's doing a lot of good in the world. Hi, I'm from that social enterprise community in Wellington, and so I have a question about where do the wider impacts on society or on the planet come into your decision-making process about who to support and maybe even your definition of success? Okay, from my perspective, it's a crucial to reflect on the effect that any company or organization we build has on the full set of stakeholders, not just financial shareholders. And that's both a philosophy uh, in terms of a way of just how I want to live my life, but it's also, I think, a, a sound business strategy. Great people want to work at companies that are having a positive effect on the world. Investors want to invest in companies that are going to have positive ripple effects throughout the societies where they operate. Uh, government regulations will be more friendly and supportive. So for all these reasons, I think it's critical uh, to evaluate what are the follow-on effects of the product or service that you're building and what externalities, positive or negative, does that create as central and core to the strategy for the organization that you're building. 
Um, so this is something we, we've spent a lot of time thinking and, and we've had a, um, ha have really focused on this over the last year. And one of the things that I've realised as you sort of get older is um, you know, when, you, when, when you start off you sort of see the government up here and you're down here and it's hey please help me and give me some money and stuff. And then as you get sort of a bit more senior then a few more things you kind of treat the government as, as a peer. So I think with that with web services like hey we are ready to solve compliance issues but you guys need to now give us um, the hook so we can get our data to you and, and, and do those things. And then I was, I was at the um, B20 conference um, in Sydney earlier in the year and, uh, and one of the panels came through and the number one issue was youth employment. So if you look in Australia, that's the number one issue and, and, you, and you sort of read it everywhere, you know, uh, people getting their first jobs. And what we realised was um, as, as a larger company now, like, you know, everyone does sort of internships and has grad programs and those things, but actually it doesn't move the needle at scale. And then we realised that, you know, small businesses, are, you know, that, that, that's the bulk of the um, economy. And if we can mobilise our base to get them to think about adding a third of a person or, you know, and we can do a whole lot of heavy lifting and educate them about, um, about youth rates, about what the minimum wage is, probation periods, how you hire young people, how you uh, actually work with young people. So we've done that work, and and what we've found is, um, you know, get to this level where you can't wait for government, and actually businesses can do a huge amount of good because you have resources. And I think with the sort of twenties uh, and thirties uh, something people you have in these sort of larger businesses, um, they all have to have a strong social conscience. That's that sort of mission uh, versus mercenary thing. And um, you know, I really think businesses can do good. And I think we're entering in this period, especially when you had massive scale, and with the conscience of people that work in these businesses who want to do good things, we can actually actively drive these things, and they're great for business. So I actually see it as responsibility of people as they get on in business to deal with social issues through your company and deal with them at scale, and that's super exciting. Yeah, <coughs> I'd say in addition to wanting to do good, if you want to have a huge impact, the best way to do it is often through a company, so you need to make sure that that's a successful business in addition to being positive for the world. It can't be one or the other. Um, we believe that a lot of the companies we invest in, because they're doing this huge stuff that can have a massive impact and you know, do something like curing, curing all cancer, for example, that's obviously doing good, and if it works, it's going to be an incredible business. So I think you need both. Otherwise, you're going to find that you're not going to be able to hit the scale that's going to get that positive world benefit that you're looking for. We, we will fund nonprofits directly, and we've funded a lot, and some of them I think are totally awesome. Um, but I, I'd say generally we want to do things that have a, a huge positive impact. And as Scott was just saying, I think most of the time those are for-profit entities. I think in the current world, and you can argue whether or not capitalism is good, I don't think it is, but the, the best way to make a change, and if you look at the big improvements that have happened in the last 100 years, most of these come... Uh, by a company that has a mission and builds something incredible and, and changes the world. And, you know, they get more ambitious as they go. They may not, like Google certainly did not understand uh, the impact that making all information instantly accessible would have on the world. And it's been a massive, massive change. You know, if we can get energy, you know, like a nuclear energy company to work, that will have a massive, massive change. But um, the a converse of that is that I won't invest in a company I believe is bad for the world. Um, twice I have passed on a company because I was that I thought I was going to make money on for sure um, because it was bad for the world. Once it was so bad, it sort of self imploded. And the other time, you know, I would have made a bunch of money, but it wouldn't have been worth it. Um, I, I think the biggest problem that the world, the macro problem the world is going to face, is that um, there's going left unchecked that we're on a trajectory to have massive, massive wealth inequality and slowing economic growth leading to mass unemployment. And, you know, it, it turns out that economic growth, I think, like everyone wants their life to get bigger every year. And in a no-growth world, it's very zero-sum everyone's fighting. Um, I think the only way that, like, the sort of developed world will continue to function is with massive economic growth. Businesses are what's going to deliver that. And so I think just continuing to drive economic growth is probably the most important thing for like ongoing prosperity and peace and everything else that, that we can do. Yeah, so that, that, um, that, that's, that's actually really interesting hearing that perspective because that's the, um, you know, uh, just being through a uh, election campaign here, 
business is is not seen as as, as great. But that's what you when you travel overseas and uh, the, the um, entrepreneur of the uh, of the year event in Monaco this year, and all of the entrepreneurs, all of them had a strong social um, uh, stroke, very strong social bias to the business. None of them were assholes. They all wanted to um, you know grow their local uh, communities and do something really purposeful. And I think that's the great thing about entrepreneurship and these startup groups. It's kind of saying that business is cool and you can do very positive things. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it if, it, if we were just raping the planet. You actually want to make things better and, and leave the country you know, in a better position than, than when you came into it, right? So business is good. And it's, and it's really nice to hear it. Just one additional thought on this. You know, I'm familiar with the Inspiral Network and a lot of the projects that you've all been working on. And I think that... Yeah, I agree with, with these sentiments that economic development has a carry-on effect that can provide rising living standards, improved access to healthcare and sanitation, increased education, et cetera. And that sort of social mission is required for any company to truly hit breakout uh, velocity in this new age. But I also think that the small acts of individual entrepreneurs are also extremely important. And it's not only through big game-changing corporations that positive direction in our society can happen. And so I also, even though I'm always biased to think about systems level change and how do we build technologies which enable you know, global movement in a very short period of time, um, you know, city beautification projects or school gardens or you know, just elderly care, all, there are so many small things that we all can do and maybe as, as a sort of initial uh, target, you know, we can still find tremendous success in that, focusing directly on the vectors of creating a more beautiful world. And you know, still seeing that the economic engine um, is required to help those things achieve scale, um, but also seeing the beauty and the small steps that we take forward. We're doing now two last questions, and then you guys can chat. Chat away afterwards, just saying. Cool. And let's try to keep those also slightly pre. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. I'm just hoping to drive out some personal stories. Uh, so obviously when you're running a startup, it's all about kind of, you've got short -term, short term finances with a long, big term vision. I certainly remember early days in zero where, you know, kind of, it was it was a little bit uncertain. If we kind of, you were always very positive, Rod, obviously. Um, Kind of what got, what kept you guys going through those moments of being kind of only being able to plan a number of months in advance, let alone a number of years? Insanity. <laughs> uh, be, being irrationally uh, committed. <laughs> you can come back. <laughs> I'd say, just, you know, in my experience, it's just thinking through the worst case scenario. Maybe you don't have a lot of clarity about where things are going, but. You know, you're working on something you really believe in, you think it's important, you're working with people you like. Hopefully you can make it work. If you can't, what's, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? You'll probably go work somewhere else. So you just keep pushing and up until the very last minute you keep trying to make it work. I had a rule with myself that I would only deal with the most current crisis at a time when things got really bad. Where, where people get really debilitated is when they think about the 30 things that are going to go wrong and that are going to kill the company. And that leads to paralysis and inaction. And the way to get through it is to say, you know what, like, I'm pretty smart. I've gotten through a lot of bad stuff. I'm going to solve those other 29 problems. I don't know how. I'll figure out that later. But here's the thing that might kill the company today. I'm only going to worry about that. And if we live to fight another day, then I will have earned the privilege to worry about these other things. And focusing yourself on this most urgent fire and, and giving yourself permission to ignore these other fires until tomorrow and not just sort of thrashing in competition between them is really big. And then the other thing is like, just keep perspective. Like, you know, terrible things have happened to the company in the past, terrible things have happened to the company in the future. This probably won't be the one that does kill the company. And if the company does get killed, it's just a company. It's not life, you know, it's not family. There are more important things. So, like, the worst case scenario here is terrible, but not, like, world ending. And, and you can probably solve it. Like, um, you know, you, like, founders are incredibly resourceful, and you can almost always figure out, you know, some way through it and, and, and survive for another day. 
I wanted to ask you what is most important when you are starting a company? Is it like a person itself? Is it the idea? Or is it technology behind it? And also what do you think about 3D printing technology? How it's gonna change like the way you manufacture things? So, so, so my most important thing is the team. So the ideas come and go, but um, uh, you know, being able to have a really good team that you work with, and uh, it's so much more fun. So I, I've only done one or two things where we didn't have a really good sort of uh, founding team, but the thing that gives me the most pleasure in zero is working with a thousand cool people. It's cool, it's like a big family. Yeah, I'd say the earlier stage the company, the more important the team is. So if you imagine a huge company, it's already working, maybe it kind of runs itself, when you have nothing, all that you have is a team, so early stage, that's, that's the number one thing. You mentioned 3D manufacturing, and while I think it's you know, maybe a second level or even third level priority, being in a sector where the tailwinds of technology are in your favor, uh, while not as important as having a great team, is really critical to your long-term success. So being aligned with 3D printing and you know, CNC and, and um, digital manufacturing, my read on it is it's going to change everything. It's not an area where I have a ton of experience, but the idea that we're going to be able to print pretty much any object in remote places, like you know, shipping things out from the US to get here to New Zealand was a huge lesson in the complexities of global supply chains. And learning like, wow, if I could just make this specialty component right here in New Zealand and save the shipping and the time and stuff, it's just so revolutionary. So I, I think it's a sector that's you know, poised for a lot of growth. Hi guys. Our product looks at um, demand prediction and the relationship that price has with it. And we, we've got ML models that work. And we want to look more at DeepNet and some of the, the future of AI. In Victoria University here, we had six people graduate with computer science with AI. And we have one of them working for us. But around the world, are you, or just even in the US, are you seeing universities getting on board with courses in AI? And what's the uptake and what's the sort of the next five years in terms of people, which is our need, that understands this technology? I actually studied that in school, so I am happy to answer this. Cool. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think it is the, probably the, like the machine learning is probably the fastest growing concentration in every good CS program in the States. Mm -hmm. And I expect that will just keep, that growth rate will continue. Uh, and I think there's just, there is such strong belief among new CS students that this is the most important thing to be working on, that that's gonna just keep going. I mean, probably AI will kill us all, but until then, we're gonna turn out a lot of great students. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, hey, thanks everybody so much for coming and celebrating. We do have an official launch party here tomorrow, so more of this. Um, do come by starting from about 5 p.m. We'll have it carnival style, there's bands, there's foods, there's drinks. But right now, let's just all give an awesome big applause for all of those guys.